I'll just give you, I'll share with you my story. I am a, a, an American football coach, uh, meaning a coach of American football, uh, <laughs> which is different than what we call soccer. And I won't explain the differences, but, um, you know, but I do think it's the greatest sport in the world. And uh, sorry, guys, I just have to be honest. But, um, but I, I do that and I, I teach I teach Spanish in a little redneck school. Um, it's actually it's a middle-sized redneck school um, outside of Atlanta, where I'm mostly I'm teaching high school kids that really don't want to learn Spanish, uh, but they're taking it because they want to get two checks, two credits for Spanish. And I'm uh, I'm a dad of four kids, and uh, a husband of one wife, and, um, and that works out better that way, by the way. But um, so I'm. So I end up kind of being, uh, I'm a dad to my kids and, um, and I end up being a dad to my players and, and to a lot of my students. Uh, but, but it didn't start that way. It started out from a really pretty messed up family. Um, well, really a, a broken family with a really messed up dad, let's put it that way. Um, so I'll just share my story a little bit and I'll try not to go too far into detail. But when I was really young, um, I, my dad was my, was my idol, my hero. And I wanted to be exactly like him. And uh, I figured that if I was exactly like him, I'd be pretty good, you know, because I thought he was perfect. And um, as I got to be a little older, I started realizing he wasn't perfect, but I still thought he was great. And, uh, but what I didn't know at a younger age, uh, I mean, all the way back when I wanted everything to be, I wanted the shoes he had, I wanted to look like him and act like him and be like him. Um, I didn't realize that he was a really, really messed up guy with a drug problem. And uh, as, I, as I got a little bit older, um, there, there came some points where I overheard my sisters talking, my two older sisters. They, they were talking to my mom about my dad's drug problem. I got mad and I was like, what are you talking about? He, you know, he, he, has, he takes medicine because um, you know, he had a surgery and all this stuff, but he, he was addicted to pain meds. And he would make these, he would, he would manipulate doctors and get all kinds of different pain meds, but I didn't believe that it was true. And so, um, I still saw him as my hero. I was, the, I was the last person, like everybody else saw that problem. I was the last person to ever see the problem that he really was having. And, uh, and, it, and it really, I couldn't even see it until one night, I was 11, I was sitting up watching a movie with him and um, he passed out on the couch and I just thought he was tired, you know? And uh, movie got done, I woke him up. He was like one of those old, good old Clint Eastwood Westerns. I woke him up and I was like, dad, you know, uh, he fell asleep. Yeah, yeah, she was like all, you know, like out of it and everything. I thought he was just tired. He woke up, kind of got up and uh, uh, walked from the couch into the bathroom. He didn't shut the door. He st stepped in the bathroom. I heard a crash. Looked in there to see what the matter was, and he couldn't even stand up. He fell over backwards into the tub and was still uh, out of it. And then standing there looking down at, at him laying in the tub, I was like, I just had the realization you know, that what everybody else said that I didn't believe was true, that he really did have a drug problem. And from then, from then, and that was, that was a turning point for me. Um, that was a, a point where, um, you know, in fact, I, you know, I started to put distance between me and him. I didn't want to hang around him. I didn't want to be like him. I wanted to go the other way and be opposite of him. And uh, even so far as that was when, that was when some of you know my thing with my name, Daniel, that was when I said, um, I don't want to be called Daniel. I want to be called Dan. Uh, and I, I changed my my whole outlook on life and so that was from 11 on until about 17 18 um, I was just an angry guy um, looking to try to figure out what I was gonna do trying to you know kill some of my own pain uh, you know and I got pretty far into um, trying to treat my own pain I couldn't do it with drugs because I don't want to be like him so I figured uh, what well, wasn't a drug that would be a good way to treat my pain would be like a whole ton of alcohol um, because in my mind it wasn't the same as popping pills, you know, and, um, so, so that, that was a turning point, uh, that turned me farther away from the road that I'm on now. But, um, but there was, but I'll tell you about a couple of other, other turning points because I ended up here. So, uh, a turning point, uh, came at a, at a camp I used to go to. We had these camps in the States. I don't know if they had things like this here, but, uh, it was like, you, you know, parents would send their kids away for a week to a camp. Uh, and so there's this camp I went to um, from third grade until 
uh, until my last year of high school. I actually went one extra year by lying and saying I was younger than I was. But it was a it was a church camp, so um, you know, and and I really just went for the fun of it. And um, you know, it's when I look back over like 11 years of, of going to this camp, that you would never think that anything good came out of it. My first year there. Um, this kid sat his naked butt on my sleeping bag and I, I, I punched him in the face, threw him on the floor. And uh, from there, it went, it got worse. And uh, so by the last year that I was there, I showed up uh, for camp and I was, uh, I was legally intoxicated and I really just about ran into a truck on the highway going the wrong way on a divided highway like this. Got into the camp and um, I met this girl that was there and uh, the only reason why I cared about her was because she was really attractive and uh, so I started hanging around her just because of her face and her, her looks and so, so uh, uh, but she got my attention and um, one thing that I started to realize was that she really had something different than what I had and what she had was she had uh, a, a personal relationship with God and I believed that there was a God because all the way back when I was four, uh, I went to a church and in this church, this guy gave a really clear message that I still remember and understood at the age of four. And the message was just simple. It was like this. There's God in heaven and he's perfect and he loves us and we're not perfect. And so we couldn't stand before him in all of our sin and imperfection. He said, but he wants to be with us and he gave his son Jesus Christ to pay for all of our sin so that we could have a relationship with him and be connected with him and so that he could give us life. And in fact, just a bit, a bit earlier, I, I pulled out a, uh, a passage and it says, God so, so loved the world that he gave his only born son so that whoever believes in him could not be completely destroyed but could have life that is eternal. And he explained that that way, just that Jesus' death on the cross was was good enough, that none of us are good enough, but he was good enough and he paid the price. I understood that at four years old. And at four years old, I said, yeah. I said, I, I you know, I want to know what happens to me when I die. I don't want to go to hell. I want to, I want to be with God in heaven. So I, I realized at the age of four, I couldn't save myself and I put my trust in Jesus and then when I was at this camp what 13 years later um, looking at this girl I realized the second biggest part of that is not just getting a, uh, a free gift of life and going to heaven but a free gift of knowing God and and when I saw that in her I realized that what she had was a, r a real relationship and that was the next the next thing that thank you the next thing that I needed to do um, was was to pick up where I left off and get uh, let that relationship with God grow. You know, when you you meet somebody, you could say I know that person, but as you continue to spend time with those people, or that let's say that person, then you get to know them better, and over time, you become closer and closer. And that's that's what I learned from this girl. So for me, I kind of got it in two steps. A real simple message at the age of four and, um, and and at the age of 17 when I wasn't listening to much else God used a beautiful girl to get my attention and to say hey there's more you can know me personally and know me in a, in a way that just continues to to grow every day and get closer every day and so but at that camp nobody saw a turning point when I left there I almost got kicked out of that camp for having um, the fifth of Jack Daniels in my car and um, the guy that was going to kick me out said all right I'll let you stay for the rest of the week if you dump it out on the ground and I decided I wanted it I wanted to see a little more so I stayed I dumped it out stayed finished the week out when I left nobody knew that there was a difference it was about three weeks after that thing was done I came back to my I was staying at my dad's house then I came back to his apartment and I was I was completely drunk and I sat down and I opened up the Bible and I started reading it and I I just said okay God I want to know you I want to let you have a 
have a say in my life and I want to I want you to control my life and take me from here because it's not working with me in charge and me in control. And so that night was a turning point and became, uh, uh, you know, and it's never been perfect since then, I want to say that, but it was a, it was a turning point from the road I was on that put me in a place where I am now, where it's still imperfect, still fail, and I'm still failed by other people. But I am, I am uh, a son of a perfect father, and, and that perfect father loves me. And because I have that, uh, what I didn't have when I was little, I was, my dad loved me, but he was the most messed up man I've ever known. And you know, now I can say I'm the son of a perfect father who loves me perfectly and never fails me. And um, so when, whenever there's a chance to share that reality, I think a lot of people just have an idea that, uh, you know, if you're talking about the Bible, or if you're talking about a, a church or any church or religion, you're talking about a set of rules and you're talking about like fix yourself so that somebody can like you. And this is, this is different because it's God saying, you know, let me take away your brokenness and I'll give you the chance to be whole and complete and to make your life worth living, give you something to live for. And, and, and I've got eternity. I, I could step out in front of a bus tomorrow and, um, and I know where I'm going. But between now and then, I, I've, got, I've got somebody that's perfect who I can know every day and get to know better every day. So that's the offer of life. That's what the real message of the Bible is. It's not fix yourself. It's let God, let God into your life and let him fix all of our stuff because we all got it. So uh, if anybody has any questions about that, thank you for being, uh, I know it's not the opportune or the best chance to tell a story, but y'all have been really um, a patient audience and I appreciate your attention. And uh, if you'd love to talk more, I would love to talk more, just let me know. Or anybody else that um, um, is sitting here that's shared their story this week or, uh, or any of us that we all came over to get to know people and to enjoy getting to know you. And if any of you are interested in, in, uh, in the stories we have, we want to share them with you. So thank you so much. Appreciate it.